All right, it's a very, very nice and cold morning here in Nairobi. But we're still having a nice conversation with my guest here. But before I introduce you to my guests, I want us to first of all take a look at what we'll be looking at today. So we'll be having the Building Bridges Initiative. So let's begin here. Early last year in March, <coughs> the President Uhuru Kenyatta and of course the former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, we had the, something we call the famous handshake that brought about and incorporated so very many bodies and today it's what we experience. Moving on swiftly, we came all along and the president and the former prime minister also, they constituted a 14 committee member bench. What was its main purpose? The famous called the Building Bridges Committee or rather the task force. Their main mandate was to go around the 47 counties in the country trying to seek the views and the proposal and of course the recommendations of the persons in the country of what exactly would like the country of Kenya to look at. What necessarily led to this? In 2007 and 2008, we had something called the post-election violence that was brought about by the election that had just happened. Today on our topic, we'll be looking at analyzing what the Building Bridges Initiative is all about and exactly after they completed their task force yesterday at Tana River, <coughs> what do we want to do? Let's take a look. <coughs> My guest today is Daniel Orongo, of course, a political analyst. He's, he has been here for some time now, I believe, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Karibu sana. Asante. And of course, I have uh, Kaberia Baru. Baru, yes. Who happens to also be a political analyst. Yes, yes, I am. Karibu sana. Thank you so much, Asante. It's nice to have you guys here. Yes. And of course, you at home, you're still, of course, on all of these you can interact with us on our social media platforms at y254 of course for me it's karanja alex w let's have this interaction together and of course just chipping in direct to the building bridges initiative dan i know where you stand in terms of the building bridges <laughs> initiative but we, we, before we get to that we have seen the bbi committee moving all around the country and yesterday they finished at Tana river county what do you think are some of the issues that they may have seen well, uh, thanks, thanks, Alex. I think, uh, like you've given us a brief on where we are coming from yes. when, uh, concerning the uh, the establishment uh, of the Unity Advisory Task Force, yes, or what yes. is other other times called the Building Bridges Initiative. We acknowledge mm -hmm. the fact that we are coming from um, a very uh, you know rough time after the election. And there was a need for political truce yes. for us as a nation to coalesce together and you know begin to you know uh, restructure our governance that that we acknowledge. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think going forward with the nine point agenda um, and ultimately uh, why uh, the two excellencies uh, decided to uh, shake hands and. Um, reassure the country of its return to calm peace and governance yes but let us not forget that you know there were other previous handshakes that had been done before mm -hmm. um jaramogio ginga Odinga uh, versus kenyatta definitely sometimes back. Uh, sometimes back yes um mwai kibaki mm -hmm. versus Raila mm -hmm. Odinga in, in the same floor of arambi house in yes. 2008 mm -hmm. Uh, and this probably will be the third or the fourth mm -hmm. um, that was meant to, you know, bring calm. So the question I ask is, with the three handshakes, if there's anything different? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, Dan, when, when you raise such kind of questions, it prompts me to come back, of course, mm -hmm. to you also. The three handshakes have, the t let me first of all come to the two, the initial ones. Uh, we may not have seen bodies that have been constituted, like the BBI building by President Uhuru and Raila Odinga. Don't you think that's a bit of a difference in terms of well, listening from the Well, views? also in, 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 in 2007, 2008, what we call, um, you know, the Agenda 4 was after the, the handshake. Yes. Remember the police reforms, you know, the incoming of, you know, um, uh, the hearing by... Uh, that led to uh, the Kofi Annan envelope, mm -hmm. uh, that inquiry by Justice Philip Waki. Yes, yes. It was just after mm -hmm. that handshake. Mm -hmm. And it's also the same. But for mm -hmm. this one, I think what's uh, um, truly different is a matter of two, ge two gentlemen. It's, it's a two gentlemen agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, one of the things Kenyans have not seen until now 
is the fact that you know the details of mm -hmm. the handshake has not been publicized has not been given to the public yes but the only um, the nine point agenda mm -hmm. that is what has been in the public yes so i think that could be the difference with the handshakes so are you trying to say that the, the persons or rather us as we are not involved in terms of knowing the building bridges well well uh, there the, is the traversing of, of of the building bridges initiative in the counties that that probably what we call is much of public participation mm -hmm. yeah. but i think there are finer details mm. uh between these two gentlemen that has not find their way yes uh within the public all right yes from that point let's first of all get to have a look at some of the issues that the building bridges initiative had been tasked to address so number one they were tasked to address the issue of ethnic antagonism and competition lack of national ethos inclusivity devolution divisive elections and of course safety and security the issue that has been affecting the country up to date called corruption <coughs> we also have shared prosperity and responsibilities and rights i come to you kaberia we have almost yeah actually we have nine points that you were supposed to be looking at mm. according to your own understanding do you think there's one that really stands out to you well i think the one which really stands out for me is the antagonism the ethnic antagonism right. and the issues of corruption yes. because this is something which we've really seen it's recurring after maybe after every elections we yes. are having the ethnic conflicts because in Kenya it's perceived that people vote towards the ethnic lines right. and uh, sometimes when we have the elections outcome mm -hmm. it does not really in well with the with with everyone mm -hmm. so i think that really stands out for me and again on the matters of corruption <coughs> because mm -hmm. in Kenya it's one of the countries whereby we are really so blessed because we have various policies to yes. fight corruption we have legislations we have systems but still mm -hmm. we are at the top when it comes to to corruption Yes. So I think there's something needed more than even just the legislation and the mm -hmm. policies because we need something more of the goodwill, which yes. I think it's something which the Building Bridges Initiative, it's something which they can be able to bring the goodwill uh, and a good uh, framework yes. on how that can be worked. Having out. mentioned the issue of ethnic antagonism and competition, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that usually emerges during the election period, as you have said. Yeah. Do you think it comes, like for instance, if right now you were to mention to people about so-and-so, they not even be considering about it. Mm. But when it comes to the election, electioneering period, it becomes like it's mutuetu. Yeah. Do you think that's one of the impact that has led to what we're having in the, in the, in the general elections period, that it's so much escalating to other negative issues? Sure, I agree to that because one of the things, because when we don't look at a person, maybe with your areas of merits and that, yes. when I look at you in the point of a tribe or ethnic where you come mm -hmm. from, I'll be so much biased. And there's a likelihood that even by the decision I'll make or the support which I lack on to you will be so much on them to wear to syndrome. Mm -hmm. And not just even in elections. Look, mm -hmm. even when we have the court cases, when mm -hmm. maybe a governor is accused of this or senator, mm -hmm. we'll see some electorate or people from that area coming and saying that Mtuetu is being targeted. So I think that's a problem which has been there. It's, it's an historical problem which mm -hmm. maybe it came from the 1963 going forward yes. because we really, we had inequality mm -hmm. and that inequality <coughs> is what really lent some communities being sidelined in mm -hmm. terms of development mm -hmm. in terms of even uh, appointments mm -hmm. looking at even the cabinet appointments and other parastato appointments yes, yes. from uh, independence mm -hmm. you'll really be shocked you'll see a very repeated pattern right. of the same faces same families, same ethnic communities, mm -hmm. which I think now it's becoming cancer in the system and really which need some immediate intervention. But when you mentioned that, I'm prone to go to Dan. Uh, Dan, there's something we call head speech in the country, mm. which apparently falls around, around the ethnic antagonism issue because when we mention about uh, this particular person is from our tribe, it becomes like something like when someone talks something vulgar, we are like, name to where to. <laughs> Well, well, uh, and I agree with what Kaberia has just uh, uh, noted. In, you know, when you are looking at where we are coming from again, yes. uh, insofar as is trying to um, bring ethnic harmony, trying to deal with, you know, uh, ego ethnic ethnocentric mm -hmm. um, based <coughs> politics, we as a country right now, as we speak, I think there are some strides that has been made in so far as, you know, those who would still thrive on inciting hate and, uh, you know, um, uh, inciting conflict, yes. feuds within the community uh, with different agenda. 
And I think, uh, again, on the second handshake, that is uh, the one that was mediated by the late, you know, Kofi, uh, Annan. Kofi Annan. Yes. The agenda for was establishment of the National Cohesion Integration Commission, mm -hmm. whose work was to um, really try to bring matters of cohesion to four. You also remember the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation yes. Commission, mm -hmm. whose report has not still find its way to be implemented in the public. Yes, yes. So we are coming again in 2019, mm -hmm. after the handshake in 2018, 9th of March, uh, you know, bringing and forwarding another task force to do the same thing. So for me, I would be very interested, <laughs> yes, yes. you know, to um, uh, ask <clears throat> the BBI since uh -huh. is an institution that is already established and has been gazetted. Yes. Even as you make public hearings in the counties, mm -hmm. it's quite important that while coming up with a report to try to check into the recommendations, you know, that were made out of truth, justice and reconciliation and right. also uh, you know, the work of National Cohesion <coughs> Integration Commission. But then my issue always been very categorical that we we are talking about conflict and perpetration of conflict we are always looking at the youth who are either <laughs> the promoters of violence yes yes and they're the victims of violence mm -hmm. but when it comes to hearing the issues that are concerning conflict the youth are not at the center stage of yes. discussion neither are the representation sure. So I would question, uh, first of all, always persistently questioning the composition of Building Bridges Initiative, not only Building Bridges Initiative, yes. but even all these initiatives that their member composition has lacked the youth component of representation. Mm -hmm. What we are treated to is a fanfare of asking the young people to bring their recommendations, of which not until these yes. recommendations are made to the public mm -hmm. and reported and hand over to the two principals. That is when we are always being able to know that indeed yes. this has been taken care of. Now you are talking about matters of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. You're talking about matters of avoiding trying to deal with ethnic antagonism yes. and always political uh, conflict each and every election. It would be very detrimental mm -hmm lack of progressive in its nature to exclude the voices of the people who are always in core when it comes to matters that we're dealing for example talking about shared prosperity why are we not having shared prosperity it's simply because resources mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are lacking out are not equally you know uh, distributed and who are they for is women and youth Lack of employment and underemployment massively. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, when mm -hmm. we are looking at the nine point agenda Just. and the issues that you've outlined, mm -hmm. it is also important that we always look at youth based, you know, uh, strategically talking about youth based discussions. Yes. Insofar as this nine point agenda is concerned. Uh, looking, looking at what you've mentioned about, you have mentioned about inclusivity, ethnic antagonism, safety and security, and of course shared prosperity. I want, I want us to discuss for just a minute about uh, the issue of inclusivity. You seem to have a concern really about the young people and inclusivity in the Building Bridges <coughs> Initiative that has a 14 member committee, 14 members of the committee. Apparently they come from a political field, religious field and renowned scholars. Do you think young people really? Kaberia <laughs> had, had mentioned something. <laughs> yes, about, he had. Uh, about, or probably, yes. Probably you would make me understand what he meant by probably why lack of. I think he said something about youth mm. missing out in, 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 in the representation. <laughs> uh, because when you mention about representation, it's really it's simply a general word. Yeah. Because when you're mentioning representation, it simply means in the governance, mm. in terms of leadership in, in, in the govern in the yeah. in the national assembly, yeah. all over these particular members that are formed. I think uh, maybe to just uh, give a tip of what I ideally talked about when we talk about inclusivity, it means that factoring out maybe the other even the the minority voices and uh, other people may not be able 
and they make that loud noise. Yes. Now, looking at inclusivity, let's talk about, let's look at even the youth and even the people from even the minority mm -hmm. communities. But now, looking at the BBA, we have a 14-member 14 uh, 14 committee, mm -hmm. which is being chaired by Yusuf, Yusuf Haji, Haji yes. and being uh, with the deputy being at the Adam Solo. Yes. But now, looking at this, we'll see that we don't have the real face which we can really associate to. And when I talk of this, I'm so much specific about one, the young people. Mm -hmm. And the time when I've seen the young people being involved mm -hmm. is, I think, only on one forum whereby I saw a group from, which is drawn from the student leaders, when they made their own deliberate uh, action mm -hmm. to go and actually look for the BBI committee to make a presentation. So that's the only platform which <coughs> I saw but a very organized... Serious delegation, probably you could mention where it was. Pardon? Probably you could mention where it was. Yes, yes, it was in, in, uh, in Capitol Hill. It's a group called KUSO, Kenya right. University Student Organization. Eh? And even it was even made public even through the media right. when they went just to make a presentation and they had their own structures. But now looking at now maybe in, th in the committee itself, mm -hmm. there is no face from the young people. Mm -hmm. So we are just left at the, the fans, the participants, the just people who are like, I can say the fans, like trying to cheering to cheer a match which is being played mm -hmm. on the field mm -hmm. when you actually should be now pe be the people now in the match. Uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite an issue to address, yes? Yeah. And when we're looking about the issue of young people and unemployment, also I know Dan has really so much into that. Mm -hmm. But I want us to look at it this way. Young people are the highest yeah. in terms of population in the country. Yeah. That is number one. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the issue of inclusivity, it mm -hmm. seems to be lacking according to what you have given out as your views. Yeah. How best can we bridge the gap? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Well, well, well uh, Alex, very, very interesting questions. Uh, before, before I probably uh, come to that, I think it's, it's, it's important to tell the young people who, you know, follow this channel uh, a lot that it's, it's, it's important to unmask the Building Bridges Initiative. It is important to uh, let young people understand mm -hmm. yes. uh, why it is important mm. for them to participate in this process in whatever platform they have mm -hmm. i will tell young people that this building bridges initiative is an initiative that will predetermine what will come in the next months or the next years before right. election yes. and so when you want your voice to be heard it's important to give your input to yes. uh, this particular initiative now building bridges initiative i watched uh, you know, um, in awe as Dr. Kurekot was presenting, you know, the, the other initiative. And there have been a lot of initiatives to try to, you know, address the same thing. Uh, Punguza Mizigo, yes. uh, that has now been mm. called Punguza Mgunia, mm. you know. There was uh, Punda Mechoka, uh, Punda Mechoka <coughs> for Nelson Kure, should be Moses, Moses Kuria. Yes, yes. And uh, now building bridges. I think the clergy and religious community had also come up with another, mm -hmm. another initiative. Mm -hmm. But particularly this one is the fact that this in initiative is not anchored in either Article 257 mm -hmm. or Article 256. Yes. It is neither parliamentary initiative or neither popular initiative. So that leaves us, young people, with a task of finding what is this initiative then? Oh, Where is, could we put our, how do we put our input into it? And that leaves us only with a public hearing. It's appearance of public hearing, which is very unfortunate because then that limits public participation and the voice of young people. For example, like Kabiria said, young people must out to just make a deliberate attempt. It mm. should not be this way. It should mm. be on invitation. Yeah. It should be based on a platform where you're given. So yes. I think uh, it is important to advise you mm -hmm. to make a deliberate effort like the ones that the student bodies made mm -hmm. and other bodies to go and give their input. But then you asked, how do we bridge the gap? Mm -hmm. Even as this task force is just winding up its, 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 you know, its recommendations yes. to hand over to the two principles, I think the fact that it's not, it's not you know, cast on stones, that that is not the solution. It is still important to even ask for a petition to put the input because it is, it, it, it is, it is lacking out in its content. I do not know the number of people who so far has contributed and has appeared in the public hearing. But what I know is that 
there's still need for more voices to be heard. But also young people are not really entitled always. That each and every time you sit on your boardrooms and your bedrooms thinking that, you know, this is our right. If, yes. if something that is not for us mm -hmm. or something that is not with us is not for us. Yeah. I think that kind of entitlement should be something that we should, you know, uh, really avoid as we speak so that we make a deliberate attempt in governance initiatives, yes. in political platforms so that we make our voices be heard. But just, just to come to you, do you think oh. youths are really aggressive in, for them to be heard? Well, I think I, <clears throat> I like what Daniel has really talked about concerning the youth being aggressive and taking up their spaces. But one thing I really believe in before maybe I come to say whether they're aggressive or not, is that uh, there is nothing like an entitlement that this is a guaranteed right for you as a young person right. to be given this. because. As we've said, during the, uh, if you had the conversation during the Labosos memorial service, mm -hmm. the women were speaking, they were saying as much as we were talking about affirmative action. This does not mean that we women, we just sit back and wait for us to be given this appointment yes. in that. And it's the same case to the young people. Mm -hmm. But one thing I like about the young people is that first, the numbers which we have, mm -hmm. and even the way we have really been able to see, we have been able to take personal of the challenges which are facing us, we really have a reason to be aggressive. Because look at the issue of like unemployment and mm -hmm. all that, it's hitting at each and every person. Sure. If you are, maybe you're employed, you have a friend who is unemployed, and that in one way or the other, it will come back to you. So one thing, I, in terms of the young people being aggressive, I can say, yes, they're aggressive, but not a very big percentage as you'd expect. And because when you talk of being aggressive, mm -hmm. it's not just making no it's not making noise on social media, yes. uh, just tweeting and using the data bundles. It's about taking the deliberate action. Yes. But for example, now if we have maybe this BBI initiative and mm -hmm. all that, and we have also other appointments coming in front, we cannot just keep complaining. But what I'm trying to think of, what if now these young people you are able to package yourself mm -hmm. in a structured way yes. and have and prevent yourself being de being divided along the ethnic line mm -hmm. or maybe another line because that's what most of the people do. Yes. They divide their youth so that at least you don't have that common voice. Because with a common voice, you are able to champion for, for either appointment, for position, for representation and all that. Do you, think, do you think university leadership is really, really, really aggressive in terms of advocating for youth development? Well, th that would be looked at relatively because Looking at the history of university leadership, in uh, I think our 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 history has it that, but the times of, uh, for example, James Orengo in universities and uh, you know um, Babu Namamba and Coleman. you know yes there was some level of political vigilance. There was some level heightened level of aggressiveness when they were actually tackling matters of national interest. Mm -hmm. And that time, I think you could remember uh, the time of the single party mm -hmm. dictatorship and mm -hmm. all these things. But even with that kind of political yes. environment, they are very clear cut that this is what we really want to achieve, that we do not only want to participate in university politics within, but then even without reflecting on matters that are concerning national politics. Mm -hmm. But even as we transition, mm -hmm. you realize that uh, university leadership in some campuses have become, you know, um, uh, what, what, what I really call also fanfare. By this, uh, honorable, likes of Honorable Babu we know and the likes of, uh, you know, leaders at Egerton and mm -hmm. more university and the rest, I think you could look at there was a salient transition in that, you know, um, it was more marred by a number of other social issues yes. compared to really uh, critical political decisions. So I think <coughs> it's important, like Kabiria said, to begin to revive these movements, to align, uh, you know, leadership, to align themselves to, you know, matters of national interest. Because then it is a reflexive of the youth voices mm -hmm. and what the nation is actually waiting for to be endorsed as the leaders right yeah be, 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 uh, all right maybe, just maybe a quick before. one before we get up maybe on the issue of student leadership yes <coughs> because this really touches me on a personal note because uh, just a few years back i was yeah. a student leader i was the secretary general of the student council of Jaramog university 
and I also happen to be the national union. But one thing, one of the things which has skewed the student leadership movement is the new act. As maybe you are aware that there's a change in the act on how the elections and the university leadership is being taken. Mm -hmm. It's something which has been so much petitioned that mm -hmm. most of the student leaders are really trying to push for the review of that. Because initially, the, as you talk, the terms of James Orengo, it is the students directly who are voting their president, their section, and all that. Yes. And this gave them a lot of attention because uh, the media, the attention is there and all that. But nowadays, what we have, you will hear of a president of a university, like maybe University of Nairobi, the person, the people who determine who is the president are less than 20 students. This is because they have formed something like an electoral college or such, mm -hmm. whereby you elect representatives who, in the other hand, now will have, will sit in a boardroom or that then they would decide on who maybe to give the votes. So that has really killed the political aggressiveness of, of even the student movement. Uh, but, but of course, we, we also need to note that not all universities are doing that. Some of them, of course, have a way of uh, involving the rest of the students. But of course, we'll be, we'll be looking at that later on. But I want for us for now to, be, to have a look at what are some of the issues that the Building Bridges Initiative leaders led by Yusuf Haji, they have come to realize. On Thursday last week, a uh, majority of Kenyans expressed concern over the prevailing culture of impunity in the country. While well, commenting on some of the submissions to the Building Bridges Task Force, the committee vice chairperson Dr. Adams Olo noted that the bulk of proposals made so far surround a runaway corruption in public surface. But before we play that clip, there is something that I need to probably bring on board. The Building Bridges Initiative uh, members, they said they cannot go on air for now because they have to first of all present to the president and of course the former prime minister the proposal and the recommendation that they have. So we apologize that we don't have any representation of the Building Bridges. But of course, let's first of all, before we have a look at that clip, corruption has become an issue that is eating up to the economy of the country. From last year in HF scandal, we have the Kenya Pipeline, the Kenya Power and Lighting Company, we have the Aral and Dam and Kimorel Dam scandal. We have the Kiambu 588 mm -hmm. million shilling scandal. Mm -hmm. Corruption is becoming the order of the day. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about billions of millions. Yeah, because it's, it's deliberately made to be that way. <laughs> what do you mean I deliberately mean, made I to mean, be that I mean, way? That, yeah, that's, that's, you see, wh where do you get money to steal if it was not allocated for? I asked myself all <laughs> each and every time. If, for example, in your house, Alex, you're living and you've left uh, 500 shillings to be used you know, for um, um, house, house budget and all this, you only knew there was a 500 shillings budgeted for. So any thief within your house would be very careful not to steal 500 because it's already budgeted for. But if you budgeted it for 600 shillings, somebody will steal 100 shillings but still remain. You remain with 500 to budget for. So in other terms, I am telling you, there is nowhere corruption will ever take place if that money is not located for to be corrupted for. Now, why are we always thinking that this is now um, uh, an issue that should be declared? Other people are saying it should be declared, you know, uh, a, 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 a national disaster to be dealt with. And you could realize that the president is very careful not to do that because mm. then it becomes an agenda for the whole country Definitely. and you know deviates people's attention towards the big four agenda and other things but this is what happens and i said if we as a country we are still crying 50 years down the line crying about corruption it's simply because we are not serious in prosecution and execution you know we have a new synergy uh, you know, that is pumped within the three bodies, Ethics and Radical Corruption Commission, ODPP, and DCI. Yes. And if we are still having cases, people being bailed out of case, and, you know, the amount that they're being bailed with is very mm. tiny compared to what they are allegedly. So I think for me, I would, and this is why I also like the proposal by Punguza Mizigo to some extent, mm -hmm. that could we have people who were implicated in corruption mm -hmm. and who've been convicted, forget the offices and face a sentence. Not really a life sentence, but face a serious sentence. Right. And could we also have a situation where if you are within the courts, the judiciary must come up with a time frame of concluding a corruption case. Mm -hmm. Because then, if we leave that in a lacuna, <laughs> we are going to see the likes of Henry Rotich right. running as a governor of Elgeo Marakot. 
And these have been treated for a very long time <laughs> that we are seeing people who are implicated in corruption being treated as our own. Yeah. What Kabiria was saying, <laughs> it is better to have our own thief. Mm. You know, this is our thief. <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, you're probably going to ask a question that I wanted to ask <laughs> at the end of it all. Looking at the building bridges, of course, uh, they want to, they are supposed to actually to have completed their sittings by October 23rd and submit all the findings and the recommendations to the president and the former PM by September. Do you think we have an issue in terms of implementation? Yes, we have, we have an issue <coughs> and not just a small issue because, um, Looking back at history, I'll take you back to history because it really informs us on where we are going. We have had various commissions and uh, they have had their own uh, presentations to various uh, uh, bodies. The Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission uh, by the late uh, Bedwell Kiplangat. We had, it was, the, they had a, a huge budget and all that, they made presentations, but what has been implemented? Mm -hmm. It, we have not seen that actually and uh, we had also the work we have had so many other commissions but the reason for this is this because when they go and collect the views they get a lot of honest views from the people and these are people maybe who are the victims and people who have really been aggrieved by the past historical justices and when they are able to present that it really touches on some people in power and those people in power the one in charge of whether to implement it or not. So because we've seen on truth, justice and reconciliation and others, the implication and was the, uh, the, the blame game was on the people who are really in power, and most of them, uh, uh, the, the ones who are in power. So you see that they are really afraid of implementing because it will have some serious implication in terms of prosecutions and loss of property.